Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. I'm glad to be able to join you today again as we open up another portion of God's Word. In this lesson, I would like to discuss the idea of worship towards God. What is worship? Well, the word that is used most in the New Testament for worship means to do obeisance towards someone or to do reverence towards someone. One preacher defined worship in this way. Worship is recognizing God for who He is, recognizing yourself for who you are, and then responding appropriately. Now, I think that's a pretty good idea or pretty good definition of what worship is. It said there are three, basically three parts for worship. One is, first, you recognize God for who He is. Well, who is God? Worship begins primarily with the nature of God. <clears throat> God, of course, is much different from man. In Psalm chapter 33, verses 4 and 5, notice how he describes the God of heaven. He said, For the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Here it says that God is right. He is without deception. God has no false actions or false words. Everything God does is righteous and is just, and His actions are governed by His loving kindness. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord, the Bible says. And then continuing in that same chapter, Psalm 33, beginning in verse 6, going through verse 9, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The second reason why we should obey God and worship God, because God made the world. In verse 6, he said, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And then again in verse 9, he spoke and it was done. So God created the world and everything in the world. And since God created the world, then obviously we should respond in worship to the one who's able to create the world. The Bible also presents God as the supreme, sovereign, powerful, the Holy One of Israel. In Psalm 89, verse 18, for instance, Psalmist wrote, For our shield belongs to the Lord, and our King to the Holy One of Israel. And then again, Isaiah 43, and verse 15, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. As a matter of fact, Isaiah himself uses the word Holy One 29 times in reference to God. So the the Old Testament particularly often talks about God as being the Holy One. And so when we come together in worship, we're not just coming together celebrating an idea about God or celebrating or praising some of His nature, but we're drawing into the presence of God Himself. But we should want to worship God because God is upright and righteous. He made the world, and He is the Holy One of Israel. That's who God is as presented in the Bible. But then we ask the question, who are we? Now, if you listen to both people in the world, they, you get the idea, oh, that we are very good people. And we count ourselves goodness based on our own standard, which is not too high. You know, our standard basically is if you do several good things, then you're basically a good person. But that is not God's standard. You see, the Bible presents us as being completely different from God. We are inadequate. 
We have nothing to give. We do not even deserve to approach God. For instance, Isaiah, the one who talks about God being the Holy One of Israel, also made this statement in Isaiah 6 and verse 5. Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Notice Isaiah is talking about himself, but he says he's a man of unclean lips and lives among a people of unclean lips. In other words, we are sinful creatures. That's what Isaiah had to say about himself and the people of God. We are sinful creatures. Paul continues the same idea in Romans chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, quoting from the Old Testament when he says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They are all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Notice Paul said there is none who does good, not even one person. Now that doesn't mean, of course, that we never do any good things. He is just simply saying no one does good all the time. We have all committed sin. We have all committed many things of unrighteousness. While God could be described as the Holy One, certainly those words could not describe man. So in in worship, we have a paradox. We have an unclean man coming into the presence of a holy God. That's how what worship is. So we see when we come together in worship, we're not just celebrating or praising God, We as unholy man are coming into the very presence of God himself. So then how can we come to God in worship? If God cannot have any fellowship with evil and we are evil, then how can we worship God at all? Well, we cannot unless we've been cleansed by the blood of Christ. Through Christ, we can have our sins washed away, and then we become holy enough that we can come before God. But there is a connection between worship and living. You cannot separate the two. You see, God is not interested in one's worship if our very life is not a life of uh, obedience to God. You see, when we live a life of moral rebellion, then God is not interested in our worship. And we see this in a couple of different places there in the Old Testament. For example, in Isaiah chapter 1, particularly beginning in verse 10, we find Isaiah talking about the people of Israel. And they were bringing their sacrifices and going through all the worship uh, rituals that they were supposed to. But then in verse 13, it says, God says, bring no more futile sacrifices. Sacrifices were futile, that is, worthless, of vain. He goes on to say that incense is an abomination to me. An abomination means something that makes him sick. In verse 14 of the same chapter, he continues, Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. In other words, God could no longer endure their sacred meetings. He was tired of their so-called worship. Why? Well, it's not because their worship was all wrong. Their worship might have been okay, but you see, the worship was not accompanied by a life of obedience. They were living lives of disobedience while at the same time coming in him, claiming to worship him. And God says, just forget it. Just, I don't want any more. If you're not going to live a life of obedience to me, forget your worship. I don't want that either. In the days of Amos, we find the same problem regarding the people of Israel. In verses 21 and 22 of chapter 5, Amos says, I hate 
I despise your feast days, and I do not savor your sacred assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them, nor will I regard your fattened peace offerings. Here was God saying to the people of Israel, Even though you're offering your sacrifices and your offerings, I will not accept them. I do not want them. He he even said, I hate your feast days and your assemblies. Again, their sacrifice was right. Their worship was right. The problem was they did not live it. There was a disconnection between their worship and their manner of living. And that's why Paul wrote in Romans 12 and verse 1, I beseech you therefore to by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable God, which is your reasonable service. So Paul says when you come to God, your body should be a living sacrifice. Worship, then, is not just something you do one time a week, so to speak, but really, unless it's accompanied by a life of obedience seven days a week, then our worship on the first day is worth absolutely nothing. We want to sometimes isolate worship from daily living, but here in these verses as we see that obedience and worship go hand in hand. What we're talking about here is the difference between external lip service and internal embodiment. We're talking about the difference between admiring Jesus and actually taking up one's cross and following him. We're talking about the difference between acting like a Christian on the outside and truly being a Christian on the inside. You see, the fundamental problem of worship in so many people today, is the fact that too many are insisting on living their lives in their own way while going about claiming to worship God. But it doesn't work that way. We cannot worship God acceptably unless we're also trying to live Him the other days of the week. I think about a song uh, that's very popular here in the U.S. I'm not sure you're familiar with it or not, but Notice one few words of this song. He says, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. I think those few words describe what we're just talking about, what worship is. We come to God knowing who God is. He's creator of the world. He is holy and without sin. But then we also look at ourselves. And we find that we're full of sin. We, our lives is full of sin. And so then that causes us to be amazed. Because we come in the presence of a holy God. A sinner who is condemned and unclean. Now how could an unclean sinner come in the presence of God? Well that's the amazing part. God will forgive us of our sins so that we can come to God and worship Him. But our worship then is not something you do because you have to. We worship God because we want to. Because we are amazed at the graciousness of God in allowing us and unclean sinful creatures to come in the presence of God. That should cause us to be amazed. You see, we worship God then because of who God is, because of who we realize who we are, and then because we have surrendered our lives in obedience to His will. That is the only acceptable worship. Unless your worship is accompanied by a life of obedience, it is worth absolutely nothing at all. That's what we find in Scripture. So I encourage you then to look at your life. Yes, it's good to want to worship God. But as I said before, unless that worship is accompanied by a life of obedience, then it brings no blessing to us. And God is not honored and praised in our worship. May we continue to strive to live in obedience to God's will. 
Thank you. It is God's will that you must be saved. First, listen to the Bible truth. And you must believe the truth. Then you must repent from your sinful life. Then you must confess by words that the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God. You must be baptized for the remission of your sins. Every day our Lord added those who were being saved into his church. Be blessed by studying the word of God. To receive the Voice of Truth International Magazine and to study the Bible systematically through our English Bible Correspondent Course. Kindly write to us. Our address, Gracious Word, P.O. Box 15, Arsradi Madurai 625016, Tamil Nadu. For more details, dial 9244204420, 9244214421. God bless you. The Church of Christ salutes you.